Dr. Lavalley, thank you so much for joining us here in studio. It's, it's always great to have in-studio guests. Now, our episode today isn't uh, the, the greatest of topics, but it's a very important one, and that's racism in, in the healthcare system and the problems Indigenous people face mm -hmm. within the healthcare system. So my first question for you is just sort of an overall question, and, and what are you seeing within the healthcare system when it relates to Indigenous people? Well, it, you know, I mean, that's a good question. Um, you have to imagine that the evolution of the response to that question really is about 20 years experience. So if you asked me the same question 20 years ago when I was you know, 10 years into practicing medicine, I'd say I wouldn't be able to see what was in front of me. It's a really important phrase I'm giving you, I wouldn't be able to see what's in front of me. Because that question, uh, the response to that question is, does the government and do non-Indigenous people see and feel what we do when we experience racism? So. You know, when I was a medical student um, in 1986 um, or 87, I, w I admitted uh, an indigenous man who had an upper GI bleed to a ward. Um, and he was, he was quite ill and I was not, I was a junior doctor. I didn't know how to resuscitate. He died under my care. Um, and I was really upset um, because he should have actually been in ICU but I was a junior, junior medical student. Right. Um, and I called several times to my seniors, and the next morning, uh, one of my senior people just giggled and said, that can happen. But he was a 40-something-year-old uh, indigenous man, so that was my first abrupt material consequence of racism that I saw. And I got a complaint from my ward uh, teachers that I was too sensitive about racism, but a man had died. So the question, uh, the answer to your response is, um, we examine racism uh, as a CEO, I'm a CEO for Kuwait Nook and Newman Oyawen mm -hmm. uh, Inc. Um, and we examine details of cases now. So we're much more sophisticated in seeing what other people don't see. And that's really the, the problem with addressing race, indigenous specific racism in healthcare. Well, as you just mentioned with, with KIM, you're the CEO of that, mm -hmm. and you work primarily with, with the northern sort yes. of region, yes. right? So um, what kinds of challenges specifically are faced by those in those northern and, and remote communities? Sure. I, I mean, the structure of the healthcare system in community, as well as the structures uh, within northern Manitoba are deficient, full stop, okay? Um, and one wonders in a population in northern Manitoba where 70% of the people indeed identify as indigenous, be First Nations or Métis, very few uh, Inuit in that area. But why is it that there's a deficit of good technology, whereas in the south, where it's primarily non-indigenous and, and uh, settler descendants, do we have more resources? So the function of racism then is not always face-to-face uh, you know, uh, discrimination and lack of care, etc. Uh, but it starts with the foundation of what the system is supposed to do relative to First Nations health and wellness. So uh, we see cases of untoward death, mm -hmm. uh, unnecessary death when we examine the cases, uh, wondering whether or not enough diagnostics and responses uh, to people uh, with their concerns coming to an eMERGE or to a doctor's office. We have many, many, many cases. And I've been collecting those cases uh, since I was a, a, a teacher at the University of Manitoba in the medical school. Right. Well, sticking with s sort of northern, the northern health region here, last month, KIM, KIM excuse me, sent out a, a press release saying KIM and MK were frustrated yeah. with the northern health region and, and what maybe a rise in incidents uh, of mistreatment of First Nations people, I believe, is was sort of the, the gist of that. So what led specifically to that release going out? Well, I mean, we've been working, we are working with the Northern Regional Health and the province of Manitoba uh, fairly closely, uh, looking at transitioning and transforming uh, health care for First Nations people, uh, assuming the Manitoba FINIB office uh, functions and services. Uh, and we're so we need to have the province of Manitoba on board for a trilateral agreement. So we've been speaking with them, working with them, working with the bureaucrats, uh, and the Northern Regional Health specifically um, got uh, uh, you know they advertised for a new CEO. 
uh, for the Northern Regional Health, and we told them at point blank that we want to be involved so that the white bias can be eliminated mm -hmm. as much as possible in uh, you know, defining who would be the CEO in an area that is primarily Indigenous. And so we worked with them, worked with them, and at one point in time, the Northern Regional Health authorities uh, wouldn't share information for us. So we had to apply for fi uh, 14 FIPA requests, meaning that they wouldn't share the information. We found out that a, a, a company in Alberta was uh, screening people uh, for a CEO, and there were no Indigenous people involved. Right. Okay, so given everything that, that we've sort of talked about so far, what maybe is going to lead to a, to a change in, in a positive direction here? Well, we have, uh, we uh, got um, uh, resources, we have uh, monies. After Joyce Eshaquan, um, the federal government gathered a number of us um, uh, two or three times across the nation. Um, and uh, I asked for money to address Indigenous-specific racism uh, at Thompson General Hospital or the Northern Regional Health Authority, and they, they gave us uh, money. Okay. And so we've started a program, and I, I, I want to apologize to the Cree speakers out there, Sagi Waywin. so it means love. Uh, so we started a, a, a program, and it commences this week, where we have uh, patient advocates who are First Nations and they're being trained in how to support people coming to emerge. So we see the emergency at Thompson General as a, a very real site of violence mm -hmm. uh, against Indigenous people requiring help. And so we've institute, we institute this week uh, a new program that's probably the first of its kind in Canada uh, that is about anti-racism, but it's supporting uh, people who come from communities where in many cases there's already a medical deficit in terms of primary care, especially now that we have a lack of nurses, um, to try and max out their uh, encounter in a positive way. Okay. So somebody coming in with a headache, with a urine infection, or a sick baby, um, you don't need to worry anything other than being ill mm -hmm. and seeking care. You don't need to worry about somebody treating you disrespectfully or dismissing anything that you say. And that really, uh, that those racial dismissals are incredibly powerful mm -hmm. and they can kill. Yeah, they certainly can, and, and yeah. there's been examples of that in the past, right? Yeah. So, um, and one of, one, of, one of the things I wanted to, to also bring up was, um, I believe this month Manitoba is starting to collect race-based data in, in hospitals, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and um, I believe it's the first province to do so. So what do you think of that, and how will that sort of help address what's going on in the healthcare system? Sure, I mean, that's really important. Our colleagues in, in New Zealand uh, have been collecting race-based data for, I think, 15 years mm -hmm. now and some examples of how it elucidates what's going on in the system that you can't see. So when a person goes into the hospital, say for severe chest infection, they get an x-ray, they, they might see a lung doctor who might write another prescription, and, and you have this whole platform of, of things that are being done to you. It's very difficult to elucidate that in an interview. But the data, we can actually separate data from white people to First Nations people, and we could track people with the same symptoms and presentation and find out where they go. So our Maori colleagues in New Zealand discovered that uh, severe, severe asthmatics uh, and separated the white kids from the uh, Maori kids, and they found through a tracking system that uh, the, uh, the um, lung specialists um, favored white kids and gave them the best medicine oh, wow. compared to Maori kids. So that's really an act of dismissiveness around the symptoms or just blatant hatred or just don't care, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but we also did that, uh, that was done in New Zealand about uh, an indigenous man comes in after a couple of beers, he has chest pain, and the white man comes in with a, a suit um, and having a couple of cocktails, and we can watch who gets the definitive diagnosis like yeah. with you know with the injecting dye and finding out if there's really a blockage it's the white man who gets it preferentially compared to the Maori man mm -hmm. so um, you know the university and Dr. Uh, Marsha Anderson has been working on this file uh, for about 10 years maybe a little bit more than 10 years she's not that old anyway um, and so that's been her passion mm -hmm. is to really hold the system accountable 
on a day-to-day, -day, moment to moment basis so that we can actually go into that system and see are you doing right by Indigenous people. And that is very important because that is a report card to the system that is meant to take care of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it sounds like great work there that's going on with, with her and, and everything that mm -hmm. everybody's trying to do. So um, before we, we wrap up, we'll just I'll sort of ask this again, and you maybe touched on it a little bit with the program that, that's going on that you guys have started, but um, what are maybe some, some short-term and long-term plans to, to address what we've talked about so far? I, I think the long-term plan really is emancipation. So really, um, we can take over the Northern Regional Health Authority. Indigenous people can do that. We have enough scholars, we have enough practitioners, we have administrators, uh, we have great leaders. We don't need somebody else running a system for us. Mm -hmm. We're really quite good scientists, okay? Um, but in the short term, we're gonna be looking at uh, at supporting uh, actions in the hospital, in the clinics. Uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, again, uh, going back to Indigenous Health 101 uh, for non-Indigenous people, meaning understand our historical context, mm -hmm. understand how the current context of racism, colonization impacts our ability to manifest um, health behavior that you can see and recognize. So really, and you know, one of the really important things to understand is that mental health is not about depression, psychosis, etc., but mental unwellness uh, for Indigenous people is a manifestation of ongoing day-to-day -day, uh, trauma that people experience in such a racist environment as Winnipeg, Manitoba, or Thompson, Manitoba. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, Dr. Lavallee, there's certainly a lot to think about here and, and a lot to look forward to from the sounds of it with all the work that's being done yeah. in, in northern Manitoba and, and everywhere with all these, um, you know, indigenous acts and and so it looks like there's a, a lot to look forward to like i said so we really appreciate you coming in yeah, thank um, you so thank you so thank much you for, for your, your insight into this yeah.